So I recently read this book and it's called The Company by Stephen R. Brown and it's about the rise and fall of the Hudson's Bay Empire. So I thought, why don't I make a video showing at what extent the Hudson's Bay Company and the fur trade in general played in the formation of modern Canada. And we'll see that it's quite a major role. There's a reason why the beaver is a national animal of Canada. So without further ado, let's go into the video. To understand the beginnings of the company, we must go back to the 17th century. The French had arrived in Canada in early 1600s and established permanent settlements along the St. Lawrence River, most notably at Quebec and Montreal. Collectively, these settlements would be known as New France. This land, however, had very few riches, but it did have one thing in abundance, furs, and lots and lots of furs. With a large demand back in Europe, first quickly became the dominant economy of this French colony. The French would acquire these furs by trading with the local indigenous peoples of the region, forming an alliance with the Huron and Algonquin-speaking peoples, also having the effect of becoming bitter enemies with the powerful Iroquois Confederacy. By the 1660s, furs had become all the rage in North America, attracting even other European powers such as the Dutch, and English. Using the Hudson River, the Dutch and later the English would sail north from New Amsterdam and later New York and create trade relationships with mostly the Iroquois, the enemy of the French. Competition was fierce. Plus by this time, the Hudson River Valley was already becoming trapped out by excessive trapping due to the interest of the Europeans. As the region supplied less and less furs, the Huron, Algonquins, and Iroquois all became middlemen, acquiring their furs from the Cree nations located more to the northwest. The furs from the northwest were superior in quality anyways. This, however, created a competition for being the only middleman between the indigenous nations, a competition that was won by the fierce Iroquois through war, even pushing out the Hurons out of their traditional territory. The Iroquois did have a ruthless Warring culture. The Iroquois dominating the region was bad news for the French, affecting the fur trade considerably. This encouraged some coureurs de bois, most notably Grosseillers and Radisson, to seek the source of the best furs further west. The two men, held by the Hurons and Odawa, went on a large expedition through the Great Lakes, even reaching the Great Plains. Here they met many different indigenous nations, such as the Ojibwa, the Sioux, and most important for the story, the Crees of the Northern Forest. Understanding immediately the scale of the North American continent and the value of the trade network that existed in the interior, Grosseillers and Radisson hatched an idea. The nation who succeeds in gaining entry to this economy, as the region is mostly devoid of European goods, such as metal tools and weapons, could profit considerably. The two men then voyaged back east, this time canoeing north through Cree territory and exploring the coast of the Hudson's Bay. Grosseillers and Radisson arrived back in Nouvelle France, leading 60 canoes and 300 indigenous traders and loaded with a mountain of fur. They were celebrated as heroes by the populace, but the governor of the colony, fearing that their exploits might shift the focus of the fur trade away from the St. Lawrence, immediately seized their furs and banned them from ever venturing west again. Quickly after those events, it became really obvious for the two men that the French administration would never undertake their grand vision of a trading scheme in Northern Canada, or would not even entertain the idea of expanding New France westward. The British 50 years earlier in 1610 had sent the famous Henry Hudson to discover the Northwest Passage to the Indies through the Labrador coast and Baffin Island. He mapped and discovered most of the bay bearing his name. However, he never made it back to England as his crew staged a mutiny and abandoned their captain. Some mutineers made it back to England, 
and the discovery was preserved. There would be few other expeditions for the Northwest Passage, many being mostly disastrous as they wintered along the frozen and barren landscape of the bay. None of these expeditions encountered indigenous peoples. Nonetheless, this meant that England had mapped out the bay. With the incompetence of the French administration in Nouvelle France, Grosseil and Radisson looked elsewhere to pitch their trading idea. Who better than the English who had an interest in contouring the French in the fur industry? They then sailed to England and long story short, King Charles II grants a trading monopoly on the entire watershed of the Hudson's Bay, some millions of square kilometers or 40% of Canada's total land today and named it Rupert's Land. Obviously, this charter was made well before accurate maps of the region was made. And the exact scope of the charter that King Charles gave this company was not really known until a century later. And it, they discovered essentially that it was a massive territory. The company, however, was not a colonial enterprise. The goal was not colonization, but rather was a business endeavor purely commercial. Nonetheless, the British Crown, with its shareholders, still had control of the company and British laws were to be practiced within the domain. And this was the business plan. Set up permanent commercial outposts around the rim of the Hudson's Bay with a permanent workforce. This strategy assured that outposts could be well provisioned with European goods and food every spring once the Hudson Strait melts and that constant contact with the indigenous peoples was possible. These outposts were also to be placed by the mouth of major rivers so that indigenous peoples could easily canoe downstream to the outpost during spring, trade furs for a variety of European goods, and finally canoe back inland to their camps. Everything was to be priced by beaver. One beaver pelt, for example, could be traded for 20 metal knives. The furs collected at the outposts were then shipped back to England before the winter ice blocks the Hudson Strait to be sold at the European markets. After an eventful time in England, Grosseillet and Radisson then sail back to Canada to essentially commence their commercial dream. Friendship with the Crees that Grosseillet had negotiated during his ventures through Cree territory was reaffirmed and the first couple of outposts began to appear around the rim of the bay. Moose Factory in the south of James Bay was established in 1672 followed by Fort Albany in 1679, Fort Severn in 1689, York Factory at the mouth of the Nelson River in 1684, and further north, Fort Churchill founded in 1717. This configuration of outposts and forts was maintained until the late 18th century. The outposts were immediately a success. Both the indigenous and the English were happy with this arrangement, and the business plan established in London brought massive profits for the shareholders. The company was even reluctant to send any employee men from venturing inside the vast domain, preferring to concentrate its efforts on the rim of the bay. The indigenous peoples, mostly Crees and Chippewyans, did all the trapping and physically brought all the furs to the bay outposts, so there was no need for the company to venture inland. During this period, however, and due to the unique nature of the fur trade, Close and constant contact with the indigenous nations was necessary. Ultimately, this resulted in the rapid spread of European diseases in the interior of North America. Outbreaks would often wipe out up to 80% of an indigenous nation. This would often slow down trade with a company as the indigenous had less manpower to first trap the beaver and then transport the furs to the company outposts. Some indigenous nations did manage to recover their populations relatively rapidly, but for most nations, their populations would never recover to pre-contact levels. It is estimated that the pre-contact population of the Canadian interior was about 400,000, then falling to 250,000 by the 1750s, and by the 1850s, the population had further declined to about less than 150,000. Remember that these numbers are exactly that, they are estimates and they can vary considerably depending on the source that you look at. Nonetheless, however, this meant that the Hudson's Bay Company was kind of forced to go inland, venture inland because 
the indigenous nations no longer had the populations to support their traveling to the posts on the bay. And at the same time, the Hudson's Bay Company was starting to face a new rival that was commencing out of Montreal. After the British conquest of Quebec in 1759, the British were the sole European power in northern North America. The company then enjoyed a brief period of complete monopoly on the fur trade. However, the French administration might have been gone from the continent, but its fur trade network was there to stay. Originally only a collection of loosely affiliated traders, they eventually organized together and created the Northwest Company, also known as the Northwesters, in 1779 based out of Montreal. Gone are the hindering politics of New France that kept the fur trade from flourishing. This new company was to be driven by profits and funded by wealthy partners who would share the profits. This made the Northwest Company, unlike the French enterprises of New France, a real rival for the Hudson's Bay Company. The Northwest Company quickly spread its presence within the interior of Rupert's land, established outposts at important river crossings and junctions. Obviously, coupled with the depopulation of Rupert's land and the increased pressure from Montreal, the Hudson's Bay Company quickly adopted an expansionist policy to build outposts in the interior of its vast domain. Cumberland House was then established in 1774 on the Saskatchewan River. And at this point in the story, the rivalry and the competition between these two companies was growing considerably every year. Each company were expanding their outpost network in the interior of the continent, often placing outposts beside a rival outpost. In the case of the Hudson's Bay, many force and trading outposts were built during this period, the major ones being Fort Chippewan on Lake Athabasca, Fort Edmonton, Fort Assiniboine, Rocky Mountain House, and many others. With the construction of these new forts and outposts, the forts and outposts along the rim of the bay began to lose their importance and many acted as supply depots. The furs were still eventually transported to the bay, but the trading goods were brought to the inland outposts where the trading was actually occurring. In the early 1800s, during the height of tension between the two companies, fighting often broke out, resulting in the death of many employees on both sides. Remember, there was essentially no police in the West. In 1811, the Hudson's Bay Company hatched a plan to establish a colony at the Red River, modern-day Winnipeg, with the funding of Lord Selkirk, who wanted to create a colony for Scottish Highlanders. The site, non-coincidentally, was the main supply route for the Nor'westers, augmenting tensions even further. Battles even took place, with the climax being the Battle of Seven Oaks in 1816, killing 21 colonists. Finally, in 1821, the British government, seeking an end to hostilities between two British companies, forced a merger. At the same time, the merger granted the Hudson's Bay Company with a license to extend its monopoly for 21 more years and incorporate the territories that were controlled by the Nor'westers, such as the Northwest Territory and the Pacific Northwest, which later became known as the Columbia Department. The Pacific Domain, inherited by the company, had politically been in a controversial status. In 1818, Britain had signed a odd joint occupation of the Pacific coast with the United States, meaning that the Hudson's Bay Company was free to use the land for commercial practices. The Hudson's Bay Company constructed a few new forts, one along the mighty Columbia River, named Fort Vancouver, and the other at the tip of Vancouver Island, named Fort Victoria. This arrangement of joint occupation did not last long as the tide of history was obviously in the hands of the United States. Miraculously, the British managed to secure a beneficial boundary settlement in 1846 that would continue the existing 49th parallel boundary along the prairies to cross the mountains to the Pacific and include the totality of Vancouver Island. British North America was honestly lucky as the U.S. had just finished its civil war and were in a fighting mood. They instead turned to the Mexicans to the south for their thirst for territory. By this time, the Hudson's Bay Company model with its monopoly and lack of settlement within its domain was, well, out of date. 
So the British government essentially forced them to focus on colonization instead of commercial practices. The company, however, having spent the last 200 years following a policy of non-intervention with the indigenous peoples of its domain, was unable to change its ways and attracted very few permanent colonists within Rupert's land. And by the 1660s, and this is a quote, the HBC domain included a population of around 160,000, almost all culturally indigenous, with 10,000 of them identifying as Mitzi and 3,000 Europeans spread over 152 posts, significantly less than the region's population 200 years earlier. Now, at this point, many committees were created to essentially figure out what to do with this vast swath of land, as they kind of didn't know what to do with it. Finally, in 1869, lacking the political will or the skill, the Hudson's Bay Company decided to transfer all of its vast domain to the British Crown, which would then transfer them to the new Dominion of Canada. In compensation, the company would receive £300,000, which is about, adjusted for inflation, 35 million Canadian dollars, and would also receive 5% of all lands in the fertile Red River Valley around modern-day Winnipeg. In modern times, the Hudson's Bay Company still exists to this day, just as a corporation and no monopoly. I do want to point out in conclusion though that the real losers of that 1869 agreement were hands down the indigenous peoples of Canada. For most indigenous peoples, this date, 1869, kind of marks the end of their relative sovereignty and the beginning of rapid colonization throughout the Western prairies and the Western provinces in general, and virtually wiping out the indigenous off the map of Canada, except for some small scattered reserves across the country. On that sad note, I hope you've enjoyed the video. Hope you learned something new about the Hudson's Bay Company or the fur trade in general. Most people do not realize at what point the fur trade plays such a fundamental role in the development of modern Canada. And if you've enjoyed the video, please consider leaving a like and even subscribing to the channel. And I'll see you next time. Ciao, guys.